And I am currently recording. Excellent. There's my stop icon. So, let's start going to the new material. We left off on biomolecules. Um, particularly, we were talking about macromolecules. To review and refresh a little bit, when we say macro, I mean big. So these are big molecules, typically with an atomic mass of well over 10,000 AMU or well over 10,000 Dalton. So they're ginormous. And when we look at these biomolecules, they're made of lots of repeating subunits. We call the subunit a, you know, a mer. So we can have a monomer, a one subunit molecule. We can have a dimer, a trimer, or we can have a, a polymer, a many subunit molecule. And as we're attaching or detaching these individual subunits together, we go through a process called hydrolysis or condensation synthesis. Um, and they're the reverse of each other. When we look at hydrolysis, we can look at this root word hydro. Circle hydro and write water next to it. So hydro means water. Lysis means to break or tear apart. So during hydrolysis, we're going to use water molecules to cleave or tear apart covalent bonds that are holding a polymer together. And we do this during chemical digestion. We need to take big, complicated molecules and chemically chop them up into little tiny pieces so that we can absorb those molecules into our bodies. So as we're looking at this process, when we look at water, water has one hydrogen or one proton and one hydroxide. This chemical formula is H2O. And if we add one of the hydrogens, let's go ahead and annotate here. So if I take one of the hydrogens from the water, I can add it to one of the monomers. I can take the hydroxide and add it to the other monomer and cleave apart that covalent bond. So when water is used up for digestion, the water is converted into chemically something different. This is one of the reasons why we need to drink lots of water with our meals, particularly when we eat meals that have lots of complex carbohydrates. We use up lots and lots of water molecules while we're digesting those complex carbohydrates. The opposite of hydrolysis is dehydration synthesis. As its name implies, dehydration is the removal of water, and then synthesis is going to refer to making a bigger molecule. Smaller molecules are going to be joined together by removing water from them. Another name for this is condensation synthesis. When we think of condensation, you can think of water forming on the grass in your backyard in the beginning of summer. So think of water spontaneously appearing during this process of joining simpler molecules together. So we could take our two monomers, monomer one with the hydrogen, monomer two with the hydroxide, and though that hydrogen and hydroxide from two separate monitors can be relinked to each other to form a brand new water molecule. During this process of dehydration synthesis, we actually make brand new water molecules in our bodies. We as human beings get about 10% of our dietary water, or the water we need to stay alive, from dehydration synthesis. So this actually generates an appreciable amount of water that we need to live. Now, as we're looking at dehydration synthesis, other organisms are better at than other, um, some organisms. Um, and this is purely random trivia for you. It's not going to be an lecture exam. If you're ever looking for a good pet, get something that lives in the desert. Because these organisms that live in the desert get most of their water from dehydration synthesis, so you don't need to water them. And they also have really powerful kidneys, so they hardly ever urinate. Um, in my classroom, I used to have some desert gerbils, and I went nine months without changing the bedding in that cage. And I changed it at the end of the school year because I felt like I should have, but they never peed, so it never went bad. Um, just random food for thought. Pet rats, though, they're disgusting. They pee all the time. So let's talk about hydrophilic and hydrophobic and these interactions that these molecules can have. So we'll first start with carbs. When we think of a carb or a carbohydrate, I want you to think sugar. Carbohydrate is also known as a sugar, also known as a saccharide, depending on the Greek or Latin roots for the word. 
Um, why is a carbohydrate called a carbohydrate? Here's some interesting chemical trivia for you. Back in the late 1800s, when chemists were trying to figure out the chemical structure of carbohydrates, they would do combustion reactions. They'd take the carbs, put them in a crucible, and burn the living daylights out of them. And chemists found that for every carbon molecule, for every mole of carbon left in the crucible, one mole of water would have left the crucible as, con as vapor, as condensation that was collected. So the root word of carbohydrate um, alludes to the fact that for every carbon, there's a water molecule. The name has stuck ever since. Now, in carbohydrates, we don't actually have literal water molecules. We have hydrogens hydrox and hydroxides as side chain functional groups. When we look at carbs, I want you to think energy. We use carbs to make cellular energy, AGP, more than anything else in our body. Yes, we can use proteins. Yes, we can use fats. But our bodies are lazy. We are all lazy people. I'm lazy. You're lazy. At a fundamental level, our body is going to take the path of least resistance. And we get the most energy with the least amount of effort by digesting carbohydrates. So this is one of the reasons why lots of people are addicted to carbs. We are physiologically pre-programmed to seek out as many carbohydrates as possible because they're such an excellent source of energy. Um, it's also slightly narcotic. Um, when people eat sugar, it has a narcotic effect on the brain. Now, most of you have been eating lots of carbs for all of your lives, so you're pretty immune to the narcotic effects of sugars. But I can promise you, newborn infants are not. Case in point, um, I have two little boys, um, and they're circumcised. And when they were getting circumcised, instead of giving them you know, Vicodin or general anesthesia, all the nurses did is they took a pacifier, dipped it in table sugar, and shoved it in the kid's mouth. And I watched my kids' pupils go <laughs> as they had their first sugar high. And then for the next half an hour, they were so happy, even though they'd been circumcised. After the sugar high wore out, though, they weren't happy. So let's talk about naming. When we look at the names of a carbohydrate, if you ever see O-S-E as a suffix at the end, that's a ginormous red flag that we're talking about sugar. Carbs. So sucrose, lactose, fructose, maltose, galactose, all of these things with the O's at the end are sugar. And every once in a while, you'll see saccar as a root word. You can see a disaccharide, a monosaccharide, sacrose. Um, whenever you see that, just think sugar. So as we look at these sugars, we can have some very simple monomers, some very simple one-subunit sugars. These include glucose, galactose, and fructose, which are listed from top to bottom on the right-hand side of the screen. Now, when we think of glucose, I want you to think of glucose as our blood sugar. So glucose is blood sugar. Now, all of these carbohydrates have the same chemical formula, which was wonderful, because I remember when I had to memorize all the chemical structures of these, it made it a little bit easier to know that these all have C6H12O6, six carbons, 12 hydrogens, six oxygens for their chemical formula. Yes, you should commit C6H12O6 to memory. Most of you, I imagine, probably had that memorized already at the top of your head as the chemical formula of glucose. But it's also the chemical formula of all one subunit sugars. Most of you have heard of glucose as blood sugar, and I'm willing to bet most of you have heard of fructose in the context that high fructose corn syrup is bad for you. When we get to chemical digestion, we'll talk about why um, there's that belief, but just to give you the short answer, <coughs> everything in moderation. If people eat too much of any one thing, it's bad for you, and because people eat lots of high fructose corn syrup, there's a problem with it. So those were monomers or monosaccharides. Let's move on to two subunit carbs or disaccharides. Our two subunit sugars are sucrose, lactose, and maltose. So when we think of sucrose, I want you to think of table sugar. Lactose is milk sugar. And maltose 
is a sugar byproduct from grain products. So when you think of malted barley um, or malted hops or malted rye, these products have this maltose in it, and we ferment it to make beer, whiskey, and other fermented beverages. <coughs> Let's talk polysaccharides. This is where things get a little bit more interesting. Poly means many. Saccharide means sugar. A polysaccharide is going to have hundreds and hundreds of subunits of glucose, generally speaking. Now, we as human beings, we're animals. You know, we're not plants. We aren't green. We don't photosynthesize. Animals, like us, human beings, will have glycogen as our preferred polysaccharide. It's also known as a, an animal complex carbohydrate. We store glycogen in two spots in our bodies primarily. We store it in the liver, and then we also store it in skeletal muscle fibers. Now, there are other parts of our body, like the brain, the lining of the vagina, the uterus, that also are going to have glycogen present, but overwhelmingly, it's the liver and skeletal muscle fibers that store glycogen for us. So glycogen is how, how we as humans store extra carbs. If we have a couple extra carbs that we can't burn through, we'll dump them into our liver and dump them into these other tissues in our body to use later. You can think of it as kind of like pocket change. If you Go to the store and you spend some cash and there's some stuff left over, you throw it in your pocket and save it for later. Now, plants don't make glycogen. Plants are going to make two different forms of complex carbs, starch and cellulose. Starch is the one that we as human beings are capable of digesting. And we love starch. This is why donuts, why bread products, why pasta products um, make so many people just, you know, feel good on the inside. You know, it sticks to your ribs when you eat a good plate of spaghetti. These energy storage products um, are digestible by humans, to emphasize that point. And this is our primary source of ATP, or excuse me, primary source of energy in our diet. Plants also make another kind of complex carb known as cellulose. Cellulose is used to make cell walls of plants. We as humans cannot digest cellulose, but cellulose does a very important purpose. It's dietary fiber. And this cellulose, or dietary fiber, helps us to move feces through our large intestine. If we don't get enough cellulose, or another way to put it is, if you don't eat your vegetables, it's very common for individuals to become constipated and have a hard time passing feces through their colon. So that was carbs. Let's move on to lipids. When we think of a lipid, the key characteristic of all lipids is they are, by definition, hydrophobic. Hydro meaning water, phobic meaning fearing. So these are molecules that don't mix well with water. Now, when we think of a, a lipid, lipids, generally speaking, are very energy dense. They typically have nine calories per gram, as opposed to carbs and proteins, which have four calories per gram. Um, our lipids are going to be used to make our membranes or our barriers. Because these molecules are hydrophobic, they don't mix well with water, they tend to self-aggregate and spontaneously form these membranes and fluid barriers in our bodies. There are three large categories of lipids in our bodies. We have triglycerides, and in parentheses next to triglyceride, I want you to say fat, because really that's what fat is. It's a glycerol with three fatty acids. It's a triglyceride. We also have phospholipids. When you think of a phospholipid, I want you to put in parentheses next to it, oil. And then we have steroids. These steroids are going to be molecules that are cholesterol-based. And from a dietary perspective, they aren't very important. But in terms of controlling our bodies and influencing DNA transcription and translation, these steroid-based lipids, or lipid-based steroids are very significant. So let's look at triglycerides in more detail. One triglyceride will have a glycerol head and then three fatty acid tails attached to that glyceride, glyceride head, or glycerol head. These fatty acid tails will be attached by a process known as dehydration synthesis. So to make fat, will produce water as a byproduct. And then to digest fat, we need to use hydrolysis. We need to work and burn through water molecules in order to cleave the fatty acid tails. 
from the glycerol head. At room temperature, we'll occasionally have some triglycerides that will be liquid, and we can refer to those as oil. Um, so more, a better definition of what an oil is going to be is going to be a liquid lipid at room temperature, liquid lipids at room temperature. So when we look at these, um, you'll probably get this in more detail in your organic chemistry and biology classes, but the key thing that separates these liquid lipids is that they are polyunsaturated. In other words, we don't have the maximum number of hydrogens attached to the fatty acid tail. We have a couple of carbons that don't have a hydrogen attached to them, or don't have the two hydrogens attached to them. Now, if we've maxed out the number of hydrogens we can attach to the fatty acid tail, it is going to be saturated, it's a saturated fat, and we, at room temperature, it's going to be solid. When we think of triglycerides, I want you to think of something that is for long-term energy storage. So instead of keeping change in your pocket, you can think of a triglyceride as that money that you've dumped into a Roth IRA. You can still technically access it, money that you've dumped into a retirement account, but it's a huge pain in the butt to withdraw money from your retirement account, and there's usually a penalty associated with that. For we as human beings, the penalty associated with withdrawing the energy from our triglycerides is suffering. We have to exercise. We have to have a calorie deficit. No pain, no gain. And most people don't like feeling hungry. But really, the best way to get rid of fat is to have a calorie deficit and feel those hunger pains. I wish there was an easy way. There's not. So let's look at fatty acids in more detail. I'd mentioned saturated and unsaturated fatty acids. This is a key idea. When we look at whether or not this molecule is going to be a solid or a liquid at room temperature, and significant because it changes the structure of things in our bodies. If we change the structure, we change the function. So when we look at um, unsaturated fatty acids, these fatty acids are going to have a double bond between their carbons. So I just circled in red the double bond between a trans fat and a cis fat. When we think of trans, this is traditionally been used as an organic chemistry term that refers to the carbons being on opposite sides of a carbon-carbon double bond, or on the alkene, opposite sides of an alkene. So when we look at a trans fat, it's an unsaturated fat with an almost linear conformation to its fatty acid tail. Because of this almost linear conformation, the electrons of the hydrogens are separated more, it's electrically more stable, and uh, when we look at the electronegativities and the entropies involved of breaking this down, it's harder to break down a trans fat because trans fats are electrically more stable than cis fats. Because they're so hard to remove, trans fats and a diet high in trans fat have been associated or correlated with coronary artery disease or cardiovascular disease because these fats are really tough to get out of our bodies. Just for some other side trivia for you, trans fats are not made in nature. Trans fats are only made when we artificially hydrogenate unsaturated fatty acids. And preferentially, if, um, if you're looking at your maybe your, your ingredient labels. If you ever see partially hydrogenated oils in the ingredient label, that's another key red flag that there's gonna be a lot of trans fats and whatever it is you're eating. Now, if you're ever consuming something that has fully hydrogenated oils in it, there are no trans fats present. All of those carbon-carbon double bonds have been removed. When we look at a cis fatty acid, cis traditionally has been a organic chemistry term that refers to same or means same when you look at the root word. So a cis fatty acid is going to be an unsaturated fatty acid where the carbons are on the same side of that, fatty of that double bond. And because they're on the same side, they have about 180 degree skew to them, and the fatty acid is bent. The bent nature of a cis fatty acid means that it's tough to pack them into a tight space. We can't stack them up like Lincoln logs. Instead, they take up a lot of volume. 
And this high volume that they take up results in them having a lower density and being liquids at room temperatures. Let's look at phospholipids. When we think of a phospholipid, um, these are used in oils. They're also going to be used in cell membranes. A phospholipid is going to have that triglycerol, excuse me, it's going to have the glycerol head, just like a triglyceride does. But instead of having three fatty acids attached to it, a phospholipid will only have two fatty acids. That third fatty acid from the phospholipid is going to be, or in the phospholipid, is going to be replaced by a nitrogen-containing functional group, an amine head. So, excuse me, a choline head. So we have a polarized head on our phospholipid. This polarized head, it's hydrophilic. It likes being exposed to water molecules. It has an electronegative preference to be exposed to water molecules. The fatty acid tails are neutral. They don't like interacting with water molecules. So what we find with phospholipids is they're both hydrophobic and hydrophilic at the same time. And there's a special name for these unique molecules that like to mix with water and don't like to mix with water at the same time. They're called amphipathic. Because they are both polar and nonpolar, these molecules are uniquely designed to form membranes that are exposed to aqueous environments. And then finally, we have steroids. And there are multiple kinds of steroids. The steroids we're focusing on right now are going to be lipid-based steroids. At the key or the heart of every lipid-based steroid, we have a cholesterol molecule. Cholesterol is an essential part of our diet. Um, we must have cholesterol in our body. Not only do we use cholesterol to make testosterone, progesterone, estrogen, and a myriad of other steroid-based hormones, we also use cholesterol to maintain the integrity of our cell membranes. Depending on our environmental temperatures, we can increase or decrease the amount of cholesterol in our cell membranes. If we want our cell membranes to be stiffer, we increase the amount of cholesterol. If we live in a very cold environment, part of the acclimation to the cold environment is to reduce the amount of cholesterol in our cell membranes so that our cell membranes can be more fluid despite the fact that they're constantly being exposed to those cooler temperature conditions. So what should you look for for a lipid-based steroid? You should look for six carbon rings being fused with a five carbon ring. That's your giant red flag structurally that you're looking at a lipid-based steroid. So six carbon rings fused together with a single five carbon ring. Let's move on and talk about proteins. As we think about protein students, I want you to think about the single most important biomolecule in our bodies. Proteins are the most common. They have the widest variety of functions. And we spend the most time in this class talking about proteins compared to any of the other three biomolecules in our bodies. As we look at proteins, a protein is going to be made of many repeating amino acids, the polymer of amino acids. Sometimes a protein is referred to as a polypeptide. Um, a polypeptide is a synonym for a protein. Um, peptide is a special kind of covalent bond that holds amino acids together. As we look at these amino acids, which make up our protein molecules, we as human beings have 20 amino acids that are in our body to make up our proteins. However, in nature, there can be an unlimited, an infinite number of amino acids being produced. Um, especially if you start working in an organic chemistry lab, it becomes very easy to mix and match side chains. At the heart, all amino acids are going to have three key things. So we call them amino acids. The first thing you must have for an amino acid is an amine functional group. That's nitrogen-containing functional group on one side. But it's not just an amino, it's an amino acid. So we also are going to have an acidic functional group. Whenever you see a carbon double bonded to an oxygen and single bonded to a hydroxide or an alcohol, that's your red flag that you're looking at a carboxylic acid functional group, for those of you who have taken organic chemistry already. So if we have an amino functional group paired with a carboxylic acid functional group, that gives us an amino acid. Now, to differentiate one amino acid from the next amino acid, they differ 
at the side chain or the R group. So in the middle, we can mix and match and have a different side chains on our amino acids or different R groups, and those determine the chemical properties of our amino acids. Some R groups are really tiny, just one hydrogen atom. That gives us a glycine. Other R groups are ginormous, and they have nonpolar rings in them. Some are polar, some are nonpolar. Some side groups on amino acids are acidic, some are basic. The different chemical properties of these different side chains help determine if amino acids like to be exposed to water or if they try to get away from water. And they also change the interaction between the amino acids themselves. As these amino acids and the polypeptide are interacting with each other, they start to give the protein a unique shape. The shape of our protein is referred to as its confirmation. And when we say confirmation here, I don't mean going through a religious class and being able to vote on church government issues. I mean the shape, the unique three-dimensional shape that a protein molecule has. So one of the big unifying themes, the very first slide we covered a week ago today was structure and function. Let's go back to structure and function. When we look at a protein molecule, the shape of the protein tells us what that protein does. So by changing the conformation, we can change the shape and change the function. This can be both good and bad. Depending on the situation, um, we can take an, a protein from our stomach, which is highly acidic, and send it to the first part of our small intestine, which is basic. That change in pH when we go from the stomach to the small intestine changes the conformation of proteins and can turn on and turn off, can activate and deactivate digestive enzymes by changing their conformation. If we change the shape in such a way that we deactivate an enzyme or protein-based catalyst, that is known as denaturation or denaturing. And denaturing is a huge part of why it's important for us to cook food. When we cook food, the high temperatures of cooking food denature the enzymes that keep the chemical reactions bacteria need to survive. And if bacteria lose their necessary chemical reactions, the bacteria die, and then we've sterilized our food. This is the basis of heat sterilization of food. Another reason why we cook our food is by cooking our food, we denature a lot of the proteins. We also induce or have heat-induced hydrolysis. We take the complex carbs, the polymers, the polysaccharides, and we, the high heat causes them to form dimers and monomers. So by cooking our food, we pre-digest it before we eat it, in addition to sterilizing our food. And a lot of this has to go, um, or is related to, heat-based denaturation. So here's an example with eggs. Albumin is the most common protein in an egg white, and as we cook albumin, it goes from being a globular protein that's dissolved in aqueous solution to becoming a filamentous protein that will then covalently bond with other filamentous albumins and form a very large complex which can no longer be dissolved in aqueous solution. Consequently, it falls out of solution and will have a white appearance to it. So you know your egg has been cooked when the albumin goes from colorless to white. And if we've denatured the albumin, we've probably denatured the proteins inside of any salmonella bacterium as well that may have been present in the egg. That's why cooking eggs is good. Also, it's just slimy when you don't do that. Apparently, back in the late 70s and mid 80s, um, and this was popular. If you ever watched the movie Rocky One, um, the popular thing to do was to drink raw eggs mixed with orange juice as your sports beverage. So instead of Gatorade as a recovery beverage, you'd have raw eggs mixed with orange juice. My dad used to do that. I'm glad that fell out of favor because that's just gross. Now, when we look at the protein structure, there are four levels to our proteins, or the shape, the conformation of our proteins. The primary structure is the first and most important level. I like to think of it as the wet spaghetti noodle phase. The primary structure is only going to be concerned with the order that the amino acids are attached to each other. So as we think of this polypeptide or this protein that's forming, we're going to have amino acid number one attached to amino acid number two, 
attached to amino acid number three with covalent bonds. You can think of it like beads on a necklace. They're just going to be one after the other after the other, and they are still kind of flopping around. They're still kind of loose. Now, as these beads on a necklace or amino acids on our polypeptide start to interact with each other, we'll have hydrophobic side chains interact with other hydrophobic side chains. We'll have hydrophilic interact with other hydrophilic. Um, and they start, these polypeptides start to form different shapes. Sometimes the polypeptide will form a coiled structure that's referred to as an alpha helix. Sometimes the polypeptide will form a back and forth zigzag, referred to as a beta pleated sheet, or sometimes a beta helix. Your textbook uses the phrase beta helix. Nearly everyone says beta pleated sheet, though. So as we look at these, these alpha helices or beta pleated sheets are the secondary structures. And there's some other ones which we're not going to go into. So as we're looking at individual alpha helices and individual beta pleated sheets or beta helices, they can interact with each other within a single polypeptide. And then that gives us our tertiary structure. Some proteins stop at the tertiary structure stage. Other proteins are going to continue progressing. You know what? I got ahead of myself here. I should emphasize here the hydrogen bonding. I spent a lot of time last week on Thursday. I spent about two or three slides talking about hydrogen bonds. This is an example of how hydrogen bonding is very important. Having these polar and nonpolar side chains will cause secondary chemical bonding, and these secondary chemical bonds will give us the alpha helices and beta pleated sheets. And then those alpha helices and beta pleated sheets will form more hydrogen bonds as they interact with each other, giving us the tertiary structure of a protein. Some proteins stop at this third level of organization. Other proteins are going to progress to the next level of organization, and that's the quadrinary or fourth level. The thing that distinguishes a tertiary level from a quadrinary level is the number of individual polypeptides. If we have one wet spaghetti noodle that's been folded back and forth on itself, we can get to the tertiary structure. But to get to a quadrinary structure, we need to take two separate proteins that have gone to the tertiary stage and combine them together. So to get quadrinary, we need two or more separate amino acid chains interacting with each other. The classic example is hemoglobin, which is going to have four amino acid chains, or four polypeptides interacting with each other, two alpha globular units and two beta globular units, four total. And these polypeptides, these separate polypeptides, typically will interact with each other via ionic bonding. So we'll have a positive ion as a side chain and a negative ion as a side chain, causing them to link together. It's worth emphasizing, not all proteins get to the quadrinary stage. Only proteins where we have multiple amino acid chains interacting with each other. So what do we do with proteins? <laughs> Lots of stuff. Proteins give us structure to our body. The most common structural protein in our body by mass is collagen. Um, there are many kinds of collagen in our body. We use collagen to hold together cells. We use collagen to hold together tissues. We form basement non-living membranes in our bodies with lots of collagen. Collagen's a big deal. Um, a, another protein that we use is keratin. Keratin is a structural protein in our hair, our toenails, and our fingernails. It's also the structural protein in our skin that makes the surface of our skin tough and waterproof. We also are going to use proteins for communication. Some of the hormones in our bodies are going to be protein-based hormones. Not all hormones are st lipid-based steroids. Um, a classic example is insulin. Insulin is a two-polypeptide hormone, so it's a quadrinary protein that is going to serve as a signaling molecule in our body, and it can, helps to control blood sugar. The more insulin we have the, in our body, the more our blood sugar will be lowered. One of the things that we need to emphasize with the protein that are used as signaling molecules is that these proteins need receptors on the surface of the cell. Protein-based hormones, protein-based signaling molecules cannot cross the cell membrane. 
only lipid-based signaling molecules can. We're also going to use proteins for membrane transport. We can have channel proteins or carrier proteins. These channel proteins or carrier proteins will allow for things like sodium ions or potassium ions to cross the cell membrane, or will allow for larger things like a glucose molecule or a fructose molecule to be transported across the cell membrane. And then what I find to be the most exciting is that these proteins can be used as catalysts, a protein-based catalyst or enzyme, something we've already talked about, and most of the enzymes in our bodies are made of proteins. We also use proteins for recognition and protection. When we think of our immune system, the immune system in our body is going to use these proteins on the surface of our cells to help identify what belongs in our body and what does not belong in our body. We use proteins for movement. Inside of our skeletal muscle fibers, we have actin and myosin filaments, two different protein filaments that interact with each other whenever we move a skeletal muscle. We also use proteins for cell adhesion. Um, in particular, laminin is the most popular cell adhesion protein. Um, it, it forms an, an interlinking cross that can link four cells together. When we think of these adhesion proteins, they help hold cells together within tissues, and they also can help different cell types that were separated attach to each other. Another classic example of adhesion is we have adhesion proteins on the very tip of human sperm cells. And these adhesion proteins are designed to interact with the human egg cell. One of the leading causes of fertility in the United States and developed world is the fact that the proteins on the tip of the male sperm are incompatible with the proteins around the woman's egg. And if there are incompatible proteins, they can't interact with each other and fertilization cannot occur. It's estimated that incompatible proteins are the cause of about 10% of couples in the United States being infertile. So it's a fairly big deal. Let's talk about nucleic acids. When we look at nucleic acids, this is our fourth and final macromolecule. Nucleic acids are going to be in two broad categories, DNA and RNA. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. RNA stands for ribo nucleic acids. We use DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, for long-term information storage. And there'll be millions upon millions of nucleotides all interlinking with each other to form one big fat DNA molecule. We call that really big DNA molecule a chromosome when we wind it up really tightly. And in lab, we're talking about chromosomes and mitosis this week. Uh, if we look at a segment of DNA, one segment of one piece of DNA that codes for a protein is called a gene. And this is a common sticking point for a lot of students. One piece of DNA will usually have multiple genes within it. It's kind of like chapters within a book. One book can have multiple chapters you can read. One piece of DNA will have multiple genes which can be read. And then we have RNAs. We look at the ribonucleic acid. There are three kinds we focus on in this class. Messenger RNA, transfer RNA, and ribosomal RNA. There are absolutely more. Take molecular biology if you want to learn about, learn about SIs or um, MIs or CL RNAs and all those other kinds of RNAs. We're going to focus on the basics here. Transfer RNA, messenger RNA, and ribosomal RNA. So these are the three we need to cover for protein synthesis purposes. When we look at these ribonucleic acids, they're a heck of a lot shorter than the DNA pieces. And they carry genetic instructions for an individual protein. One piece of RNA will have the information for one protein, as opposed to one piece of DNA having the information for many proteins. So because RNA does less, it's a less complicated molecule and has less in it because it doesn't carry as much information. We use these RNAs, the mRNA, rRNA, and tRNAs, messenger, ribosomal, and transfer RNAs. We use those three RNAs to assemble proteins based on the information that we store in our DNA. So here's a figure comparing and contrasting the two. DNA is double-stranded. RNA is single-stranded. And as we're looking at these, some key differences I want to emphasize for you. Oh, 
is that in RNA, we have a uracil. In DNA, we have a thymine. That's a very key difference between them. In addition to DNA being double-stranded in RNA, and RNA being single-stranded. Now, in terms of bonding or attaching molecules, um, you should write in your note that C always pairs with G, and A always pairs with T for base pairing rules. And then in RNA, we'll still have C to G, guanine pairs with cytosine, but instead of A to T, in RNA we have A pair with U. So when we get to our um, two chapters from now, I believe it's chapter four, when we talk about protein synthesis, we'll come back to these base pairing rules. Now, as we look at a generic nucleotide, there's three components that make up any generic nucleotide. We're going to have a nitrogenous base. If that nitrogenous base is a ribose sugar, it is going to be RNA. If that nitrogenous base is a deoxyribose, it's DNA. We'll also have the, excuse me, this is the sugar. The nitrogenous base is the adenine or the thymine or the guanine or the cytosine. Sorry about that. I misspoke. So the, the ribose or the deoxyribose is the sugar. The nitrogen space is what determines the A, T, C, or G. In this figure, adenine is our nitrogen space. We also are going to have a phosphate functional group. Um, this particular molecule has three phosphates attached to it. So we have a ribose sugar, three phosphates, and an adenine. Um, and as we look at this, um, it is going to be an adenosine triphosphate. This adenosine triphosphate is the basis of chemical energy in our cells. This is the energy currency of our cells. And this is something, a very special nucleotide, we're going to talk about again and again and again. We want to make as much ATP, adenosine tripos triphosphate, as possible. The reason ATP is so energetic is we have this triphosphate. And at that triphosphate, that very last phosphate functional group doesn't like being attached. It's, electro, electrically speaking, very unstable and has a tendency to burst off of the molecule, releasing energy. So we use ATP, adenosine triphosphate. It's an energy transfer molecule in our bodies. It's going to store energy from, that we harvest from our extragonic reactions or chemical reactions which give off heat. When we think of exergonic, think of chemical reactions where we're breaking down a molecule. We go from a complicated to a simple molecule, and it gives off heat. And that heat energy can be harvested and stored in an ATP molecule. That ATP molecule powers the chemical reactions when we move a chemical against the concentration gradient or when we make a more complicated molecule out of simpler molecules. So as we look at that second and third phosphate group, the one I highlighted in the last figure, those two phosphate groups are very unstable. And that third phosphate is prone to being ejected very rapidly. And this tendency to eject the third phosphate is elect or energetically how ATP stores its energy. So let's pause for a moment here and have a polling question. Please pull out your phones or follow along on your computers. What is the most common macromolecule in our bodies? Just to reiterate, um, this question is just graded on participation. If you get it wrong, that's totally okay. Um, a good practice is to answer the question right away and then try to answer correctly. So make sure you get an answer recorded and then you can try to answer it correctly. What's the most common molecule in our body? Another way to think of this is what molecule does the most, what molecule has the most functions in our body? We are down to about 15 seconds. Make sure you submit your answer now if you have not yet submitted an answer. All right, that's time. So as we look at this, guys, gals, the most common molecule in our body, by far, 
is proteins. If we were to remove all of the water from our bodies, so if we were to mummify ourselves, most of what's left over would be proteins. Over half of our dry weight is proteins. So the class, we did fairly well. Um, most of us got it right, and these results are pretty normal. Um, it's usually between proteins and carbohydrates. Um, but we as humans are mostly proteins, just to emphasize that. So we are done with that presentation. Let's move on to the cell. We just took eight credits of chemistry and squeezed it into one PowerPoint presentation. We're now going to move on to chapter three, the cell. So as we look at chapter three material, we're going to focus on two main things in this presentation. We're going to focus on the shapes or the structure of cells, and then we're going to focus on the functions of cells. And to understand these ideas, we're going to dive into the cell membrane, the extracellular matrix, and we're also going to spend time diving in on to, into the internal structures of the cell, the organelles inside of the cell. So let's talk cell theory. When we think of cell theory, a key idea here is that the cell is the smallest or simplest unit of life, the smallest living thing in our bodies. In nature, is a cell. Anything smaller than a cell is non-living. So a molecule, an atom, an organelle, these are all smaller than cells. They are non-living. When we look at cells, we call them the structural and functional unit of life because all living things come from these cells. Depending on what the cells do in our bodies, they can form different tissues, these tissues will aggregate into different structures. These structures will give us different functions. So at the basis, we are ourselves. We think about it at a very fundamental level. Now, to make a cell, we need a cell. All cells will come from a pre-existing cell. We started out from pre-existing cells from our parents. Our mother contributed an egg. Our father contributed a sperm. Those pre-existing cells were used to make every other cell that you are today. And as we look at the different cells in our bodies, um, all cells across the spectrum of life are going to have very similar characteristics. Now, if the life forms are very different from each other, the characteristics are a little bit more different, but the life forms are similar to each other, those characteristics between cells are going to be more common. There will be more similarities between the cell types. In human beings, we have about... 200 different kinds of cells. And these 200 kinds of cells are going to have different shapes or different structures. As we're looking at the shape of cells, if it's a flattened cell, we call it squamous. If it's an elongated cell, we call it columnar. And if it's kind of a boxy or spherical cell, we call it cuboidal. Now, when we're looking at these cells, it's really important to emphasize that depending on our viewpoint, they will look very different. Think about last week when you chopped up spaghetti and bananas in labs, during lab. Depending on how you sliced it, you could get very different viewpoints of your spaghetti or your banana. And the same is true of these cells and these tissues. Depending on how we cut it, if we have a transverse, a coronal, or a mid-sagittal slice through the, cell, the tissues, we get very different viewpoints as we slice through these three-dimensional objects. So we talked about the three most common ones, the squamous, the cuboidal, and the columnar. But there are other shapes that are out there. We can have stellate or star-like cells. So if we look at a multipolar neuron, that's going to be stellate. We can have fusiform. When we think of fusiform, most people think of smooth muscle tissue. When we think of spheroid or ovoid, we can think of white blood cells. When we think of discoid, um, sometimes it's referred to as a biconcave disc. Most people think of red blood cells or erythrocytes. We can have polygonal. When we think of polygonal, that means many shapes or many sides. Poly for many, gonal for the shape or side. So those are going to be our very irregularly shaped cells. Um, a good example of polygonal cells are going to be in the transitional epithelial 
tissues, you'll look at some transitional epithelial tissues next week during lab when you look at the inside of a urinary bladder under the microscope. Now, cells, generally speaking, are pretty tiny, animal cells at least. They're typically between 10 and 15 microns or micrometers in diameter. Now, there's exceptions. Human egg cells are ginormous. They're about 100 micrometers or microns across. To give you some perspective, this is one-tenth of one millimeter. So it's just on the edge of human vision. You can just almost see a human egg cell with your naked eye if you have really good eyesight. Some cells in our bodies are over one meter long. In particular, neurons in our bodies have very long axonal attachments. And these very long cells are considered wires that conduct electrical information from one part of our body to another part of our body. Now, if we look at a cell size, overall these cells can change in size, um, but the overall size is pretty limited because the cell needs to be able to move chemicals from the outside to the inside in a time-dependent fashion. If the cell becomes too big, it takes too long to transport the chemicals it needs to stay alive, and the cell will die. So we typically have a maximum upper limit for the sizes of our cells. And a small increase in the diameter of the cell is going to cause a dramatic increase in the volume. Think of the formula for the volume of a sphere, 4 thirds pi r cubed. So a small increase in diameter or radius is going to cause the volume to increase at a cubic ratio or to the third power. So we have a dramatic increase in volume to the cubic power, or third power, surface area is only increasing at a square power. So volume increase is much faster than surface area. And because volume is going to increase disproportionately relative to surface area, we have a maximum upper limit to the size of our cells. Now, as we look at cells, there's different ways we can look at them. You, as students in Bio 214, are going to use light microscopes, or light microscopy, LM, to look at your cells. Uh, in lab, we typically max out at 400 times total magnification. In bio 314, we'll go to 1,000 times total magnification when we wipe off the oil immersion and you spend time identifying different white blood cells or leukocytes. We also can have a scanning or transmission electron microscope. Scanning electron microscopes are going to take the cell, put it in a vacuum, and then bounce electrons off the surface of the cell. Transmission electron microscopes will take that tissue, put it in a vacuum chamber, and shoot electrons through the cell. The advantage of using electrons instead of visible light photons is that electrons have a shorter wavelength. They oscillate with lower wavelengths and higher frequencies. Um, and that lower wavelength, or the, the smaller oscillation of an electron, means you can physically make out more detail using electrons to illuminate your cell as opposed to using visible light photons, which wavelength at a, wa oscillate at a higher wavelength and are not as likely to hit those really tiny structures. As we look at a human cell, or really an animal cell, our cells are going to have some structures on the outside. This structure that separates the outside of the cell from the inside of the cell is referred to as the cell membrane or plasma membrane. It is going to be made of a combination of proteins, carbohydrates, and a whole bunch of phospholipids. It's mostly going to be phospholipids. And on the inside of the cell, we have the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm can be defined as everything on the inside of the cell. And depending on the textbook, sometimes they include the nucleus as part of the cytoplasm. Sometimes they do not include the nucleus as part of the cytoplasm. I am not going to be that pedantic. You know, ultimately, as long as you know that the nucleus is in the cell and the cytoplasm is everything in the cell, we'll call it good. So we have organelles as part of the cytoplasm. The biggest, most notable organelle, organelle is the nucleus, but there's other organelles we're going to talk about. We're also going to have some protein-based filaments that give the cell its shape. Those protein-based filaments are called the cytoskeleton. We have inclusions, which are storage containers made of phospholipids on the inside of our cell. And then we have the cytosol, S-O-L. The cytosol, and I am going to be kind of picky here, is the liquid on the inside of the cell. So the cytoplasm and the cytosol are two different things. The cytoplasm, 
is an umbrella term that includes all solid and liquid structures on the inside of the cell. The cytosol, S-O-L, is only the liquid component of the cytoplasm. And then we have liquid outside of the cell. That's referred to as extracellular fluid, or ECF. An abbreviation for the cytosol is ICF for intracellular fluid. So here's a classic figure for the cell. We can see that there's an inside, there's an outside, there's a membrane that makes the barrier, and there's a whole bunch of different stuff on the inside of the cell. We'll spend some time talking about those things. First, let's focus on the plasma membrane, or the cell membrane. This cell membrane, or plasma membrane, separates the inside of the cell from the outside of the cell, the intracellular fluid from the extracellular fluid. And as we look at the plasma membrane, you can view it under a high magnification SEM or TEM, scanning electron micrograph or transmission electron micrograph. When you look at it under an electron microscope, you can see individual phospholipids, individual molecules that make up the cell membrane. And this cell membrane, which is shown right here, is made up of a phospholipid bilayer, two layers of phospholipids. The polar heads are pointing towards the aqueous intra and extracellular fluid. The nonpolar fatty acid tails will congregate near themselves, pointing towards the middle of the cell membrane. And it's the fact that these nonpolar fatty acid tails self-aggregate that causes the cell membranes to spontaneously form. You could take a bunch of phospholipids, squirt them in a container full of water, shake it up, and you will get little cell membranes spontaneously forming based on electrochemical interactions. So what does the cell membrane do? It gives us the boundary of the cell, it helps our cell interact with other cells, and it controls what goes in and out of our cell. So as we look at cell membranes, they're overwhelmingly going to be made of lipids. The most common lipid is the phospholipid. That phospholipid is amphipathic to review from what we talked about earlier in this class period. So it has a hydrophobic and a hydrophilic region that spontaneously self-assembles to form the bilayer. The hydrophobic part is going to be in the middle. The hydrophilic part will be pointing towards the outside. <coughs> As we look at these phospholipids, they have a tendency to bounce around within their individual lipid layer or phospholipid layer. Um, the term that's used to describe this is a fluid mosaic. This is the analogy that's used. So we have all these individual subunits bouncing around within the cell membrane. It's like a mosaic piece of art, but instead of the pieces of glass or tile being stationary, the pieces of glass or tile are bouncing around, constantly shifting. So here's a zoomed-in figure of a phospholipid bilayer, cell membrane. We have, in yellow, the phospholipids. In purple, we have membrane proteins. In teal, we have cholesterol molecules. And then in green, we have carbohydrates. So the cell membrane is overwhelmingly lipid, but it's not only lipid. We're also going to have proteins and carbs involved as well. What do we use the cholesterol for? We use the cholesterol to stiffen the cell membrane. The more cholesterol we have, the stiffer the membrane, or the more viscous the membrane is going to be. When we look at a glycolipid, a glycolipid is going to be a carbohydrate attached to a phospholipid head. So it's a combination of a carb and a lipid, or a glycogen molecule attached to a phospholipid. Glycolipids are typically going to have the carbohydrates towards the outside of the cell, and they're used for identification purposes. The classic example is going to be the differences between A, B, and O blood types. A, B, and O blood types will have different glycolipids on the surface of their cell that influence how those red blood cells are categorized in our bodies. These glycolipids also make the glycocalyx. When we think of a glycocalyx, I want you to think of the slimy part on the outside of a cell. This glycocalyx is a non-living component of the cell. It's extracellular, and it's a bunch of carbohydrates acting like a sponge, sucking up water molecules so that it's slimy in appearance. 
and texture. And that's a good spot to stop. We'll pick up Thursday on membrane protein. Thursday we'll pick up on membrane proteins.